Our first reading comes from the book of Genesis. So God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. God said, See, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree with its seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the air, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw everything that he had made, and indeed, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Our second reading comes from the book of Romans. Therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand, and we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint us, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. Holy wisdom, holy word. Good morning. It is so good to see you. It's always good to have Phil and his trio with us together, uh, bringing music during the summers. And I also want to take a, a moment just to welcome Alberto Del Paz. Uh, Alberto is uh, our new assistant choir director. He'll start with us officially in the fall. And so we welcome him, and we'll look forward to seeing a lot more of you. Let's pray together as we go to God's word. Gracious and holy God, open our hearts and minds to your word to us this morning. Help us to silence in ourselves any voice but yours and to listen for your shouts and whisperings into our lives, leading us to a better way. Help us to receive your grace and may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts, may they be acceptable in your sight. For you, O oh Lord, are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So we're in this summer series talking about spiritual practices. These are everyday ways that God shows up in the world. And this morning we're going to talk about caring for creation or environmental stewardship. I will be honest with you that to me, those churchy phrases, environmental stewardship and caring for creation, they seem dishonest. They feel like euphemisms that try to make us feel better about the incredible crisis that is facing our planet and the increasing unlikelihood that we can do anything about it. Who wants to talk about that on a beautiful Sunday morning. Trying to get church people to take the planet seriously, pastor and author Brian McLaren, an author I love, has written a new book that he has titled Life After Doom. In it, he explores the complexity and the challenge of living in a world where human beings have failed to care for the earth as we should. It is a challenging book and an important one, and I will draw on it throughout this morning's sermon. I was reading the book in Alt Park a few weeks ago. The title, Life After Doom, draws some interesting looks if you carry it around with you. And a woman uh, walked by me with her dog. She saw the title, she stopped, and she said, Life After Doom, that looks like happy reading. And she asked what it was about. And I told her, and she looked at me, struggling a bit for what to say. And then she said something like this, yeah, it's, 
it's a terrible problem. I try to do the right thing. I wash and reuse my plastic bags. What else is an individual person able to do? I think many of us might say something similar. The problem of the environment seems so immense and our own ability to change things seems so small. What does a faithful response look like? How does one keep from losing hope? This morning, I'm going to try to offer some suggestions. Let's start with our own material, with what the Bible says about our relationship with creation, which begins in the very first chapter of the book of Genesis. Here, I'm going to call some attention to familiar elements of the creation story and maybe reframe for you some traditional interpretations. The phrase that gets the most attention is this one from verse 26. Let us make humans in our own image, according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and the cattle and the wild animals and every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. The misuse of the word dominion has been incredibly damaging to the environment and to our human relationships with one another. Again again and again, we interpret it to mean that human beings have been given the rest of the planet to use to its exhaustion in service of human purposes, as if God gives us a mandate to exploit the rest of creation. But the problem with that interpretation is that the, same, the, the rest of that same verse and the story itself does not match with that interpretation. Note that the very first phrase of the passage says that humans are created in the image of God, according to God's likeness. So apparently whatever dominion we have over the earth should reflect what God would do, how God would behave in correspondence to creation. And that we should exercise the same tender, loving, responsible care for all creation that the creator has for it. A couple of other observations about this story reinforce that point and should keep us humble. Did you ever notice that on the sixth day of creation, God makes humankind? But on that very same day, God creates all of the other animals that populate the earth. So humans who think that we're so important don't even get our own day. Did you also notice that at the dawn of creation, the vision of humanity, the first look we get at humans and how they give glory to God is not at all what we usually think of as a glorious human being. As Brian McLaren states that the icon of humanity is not royalty in a palace, it's not a conquistador on a horse, it's not a white man in a pulpit at church. No, what gives glory to God is a couple of naked indigenous people living in a garden in harmony with each other, with themselves, with their fellow creatures, with the earth itself. That is what we were created to be. Tragically, we have lost sight of this original intention for the created order. We've replaced it with a vision of the world mostly based on domination. Domination of one people over another people. And the gutting of the Earth's Earth's resources for the convenience and advancement of human beings. These things are not only normal for us, they have often been blessed by Christians throughout time who have usually been taught to think of ourselves as masters over the rest of creation. And the great irony of our environmental crisis is that the constant drive to advance and improve the lives of particularly affluent human beings is often the very thing that is ultimately leading to our destruction. The destabilizing of our own climate has its innate risks, 
as ocean levels rise and natural disasters worsen. But the changes in climate also have dire side effects as destabilized human populations fight over natural resources and refugee crises increase as peoples flee from lands that are no longer livable. The situation I am describing makes many of us feel hopeless and helpless. We read of the regular failures to change the course of environmental damage, and we feel that there is nothing we can do. If the leaders of the G7 and the titans of industry can't make any real commitments to stop climate change, what does it matter if I use another plastic bag? So we give up. In the past few minutes, I've been following McLaren's work, which is extremely well-researched, and I'll admit that I've been lecturing you a bit about climate change, which probably isn't needed, and I am as guilty as the rest of you. But I've been talking about this and setting it up in service of something I think people of faith need to be talking about, this temptation I mentioned to give up. Giving up or losing hope whether it is on earth care or anything else that threatens us with hopelessness, these are spiritual matters. We have to figure out in this life we've been given how not to give up. McLaren's book acknowledges this, so as we continue thinking about creation this morning, I want to turn for a few minutes to some thoughts about hope what it isn't, and also what it is. So the Bible has a lot to say about hope, and one of the most significant passages is the one you heard this morning from Romans chapter 5. It says that when we are met with hard times in life, suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint us. These words were written by the Apostle Paul, the primary author in the New Testament, wrote more, than, more of it than anyone else, and his most important insight was that God's grace and love, and not our own effort, but God's grace and love is the foundation of hope. The powerful insight that inspired Paul is that you don't have to find hope inside of yourself because hope begins with God. We don't have to hope in life because we think we can earn salvation if we do it well enough or if we do it good enough to earn God's love. No, Paul says that God loved us first and we persevere in doing the right thing in life because we're grateful. So hopeful living is not about outcomes. It's about gratitude. That's where hope begins. And likewise, I suspect that hope for the planet happens when we stop stewing about whether or not we can fix the damage, but instead take care of God's created world because we love it. Because we love the salmon and the heron, the ocean and the prairie, the magnificent sequoia, and maybe even the mosquito. McLaren talks about a reimagining of hope in his book. And as he reimagines hope, he follows the work of a theologian named Miguel de la Torre, who I actually heard speak at a conference here in Cincinnati some years ago. De La Torre's stance is that most of us misunderstand hope and that hope has often been used in terribly destructive ways. Hope is often confused with optimism. It is thought of as a naive belief that things will turn out okay in the end even if all of the evidence suggests otherwise. This kind of hope May make, us, may make us feel better for a short time, 
but it doesn't change anything. Even more harmful is the way that this kind of naive hope appears throughout human history when one group of people conquers another people and tries to get them to take it. When Christians have colonized or conquered people and they are living in unfair circumstances, we have often asked them to imagine for themselves a better life in heaven. We know that life is horrible for you, says the conqueror, but hope in God and be happy. Salvation will come someday. This is precisely the way that white American Christianity was introduced to slaves. Miguel de la Torre says that in order for things to change, people don't need this kind of pie-in-the-sky hope. What people need is to be desperate, for desperation is what inspires people to change. And that message is hard to hear, but it tells us something important about what hope is about. Real hope is not telling people to accept things for what they are, but it's about inspiring people that things can be different. That's what changes the world. Again, in the context of slavery, it was not that kind of hope that created the Underground Railroad and the abolitionist movement, rather simply waiting for a life in heaven. For anyone who was enslaved, Freedom in a distant land hundreds of miles away by foot must have seemed impossible. For an abolitionist, putting one's life and family on the line to stand for the freedom of another was a tremendous sacrifice. So it was not naive optimism, but a desperate kind of hope that caused things to change. Today, whether we look at the oppressions being visited upon Palestinians or Ukrainians or Sudanese or intractable social issues in our own country like gun violence or opioid abuse or the struggle for the environment that began this sermon, the desperate kind of hope, the kind that leads to action, that is the kind of hope faithful people need to talk about. Can we connect that kind of hope back to what I was saying about loving the earth? I think we can. I think we can because human history is full not only of terrible mistakes, but also wonderful goodness. Consider this quotation from historian Howard Zinn. It's quoted in McLaren's chapter on hope. I'm going to read it to you at length. To be hopeful in bad times is not just foolishly romantic. It is based on the fact that human history is a history not only of cruelty, but also of compassion, sacrifice, courage, and kindness. What we choose to emphasize in this complex history will determine our lives. If we see only the worst, it destroys our capacity to do something. If we remember those times and places, and there are so many where people have behaved magnificently, this gives us the energy to act. And at least the possibility of sending this spinning top of a world in a different direction. And if we do act in however a small way, we don't have to wait for some grand utopian future. The future is an endless succession of presents. And finally, listen to this. To live now as we humans think, as we think humans should live. To live now as we think humans should live, in defiance of all that is bad around us, is itself a marvelous victory. Who knows if the earth can be saved? 
but perhaps Christians shouldn't get stuck fretting about the results. Maybe instead we should simply be committed to living as human beings should live, whatever the outcomes might be. That sounds to me a whole lot like what Paul says about endurance, character, and hope. Christians do the right thing not because of what we can earn or achieve, but because we are grateful for what God has already done for us. If we are grateful for the earth, for the sunrise, the rainforest, the rushing river, the magnificent eagle, and for one another, who knows if the world can be saved, but if we live as it can, we do so because we are grateful. I invite you to take that thought with you as you go into your week. That the daily, individual, and collective steps we take to save the planet need not begin with proof of what the outcome will be or what anybody else is doing, but can be valuable first because loving the earth is the right thing to do. And we can experience the very presence of God and glorify God in the choices that we make. Choices that deny a world of domination and exploitation and that lead us back to the garden where God created us for harmony. Or maybe consider these words of the Cherokee author Randy Woodley. To accept our place as simple human beings, beings who share a world with every seen and unseen creature, to accept our place as simple human beings, that is to embrace our deepest spirituality. To God be the glory.